the FX bow fighter. Let's see what we get inside the box right here on Gary Stuff. Hello there, I'm Gary, welcome to my channel and welcome back if you've been here before. So today I'm looking inside the box of this, the FX Bristol Bowfighter TF10 in 172nd scale. It's a kit I've wanted to make for quite a while, so I'm quite excited to see what's inside. As usual, have a brief look at the history of the Bowfighter. We'll have a look at what other kits are available. And of course, we'll have a look at what you get for your money in the box. Now, if you enjoy the show, and I really hope you do, please remember Imperial thumbs up on the like button below because every like counts. If you haven't done so yet, please do subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, and you'll be notified of all my future videos, including the build video of this kit. And of course, if you want to offer a bit more concrete support, you can do that through Super Thanks, through becoming a channel member, or through any of my online partner programs. There's quite a lot to have a look at, so why don't we make a start and have a quick look at the history of the Bristol Bowfighter. The Bristol Bowfighter was a heavy fighter aircraft developed from the earlier Bristol Beaufort bomber. Responding to specification F-37-35, a design team under LG Fries used the wings and tail of the Beaufort with a new fuselage mounting four 20mm cannon in the belly and six 0.303 inch machine guns in the wings. The first unarmed prototype flew in July 1939, powered by two Bristol Hercules engines. The first two types developed were the Mark 1C for RAF's Coastal Command and the Mark 1F for Fighter Command. The Hercules engine was in short supply, being used by short sterling bombers among others, so the Mark II Bowfighter was designed using the Merlin 20 engine. One of the stranger versions proposed was the Mark V, fitted with a four-gun turret just behind the pilot. The turret severely reduced the top speed of the aircraft and the experiment was dropped. The next full production version, the Mark VI, returned to the Bristol Hercules engine but incorporated a dihedral tailplane and larger fin to reduce some longitudinal stability issues that had been found in service. One cure that had been proposed was a twin-tailed version, but this was found to affect performance far too much. The final large production variant was the Mark 10, of which over 2,000 were built, with the most powerful of the Hercules engines. A sub-variant, the Mark 11, was similar but could not carry a torpedo. Both fighters saw action from the Battle of Britain through to the end of the war and beyond. Notable roles included as a night fighter with air interception radar, whose pilots included the famous Cat Size Cunningham. Both fighters were later equipped with torpedoes, known familiarly as Torbos, taking over from the Beaufort from which they had been developed. They were also cleared to fire rockets, a task they did with great effect in anti-shipping strikes on German supply convoys. Attacks were made at perilously low level, often in the face of intense flak and the risk of friendly fire, a constant threat. Some 364 aircraft were built in Australia, designated the Mark 21, where they served heroically against Japanese forces in the Pacific Theatre. The type was also used by the RAF in the Malayan Emergency of 1949. Altogether, 5,928 bow fighters of all marks were built. Six aircraft are currently on display in museums in Australia, in the UK and in the USA, with a further aircraft being restored in Canada. One more aircraft is being restored to flying condition by the fighter collection at Duxford Aerodrome in the UK. This 172nd scale FX kit was released in 2016, a year to new parts version of a new mould kit released in 2015. The previous FX kit came from 1958, 
with new boxes and markings along the way up to the last relaunch in 2008. Frog made a kit of the Bow Fighter in 1969 and released versions up until this one in 1976. The kit was also sold by UPC and Hasegawa in 1970, then through the usual range of Eastern European makes including Novo, Mir, Corpac and Kematic. Matchbox made what I seem to remember being a really good kit of the Bow Fighter in 1974, sold through to this boxing of 1993, after which it was marketed by Revel from 2009. Hasegawa created their own tuning of the Bow Fighter in 1998, and in their usual style have followed it with numerous boxings, including a TT Mark 10 target tug, and this rather fetching Mark 21 from the Pacific War. The Hasegawa kit was also sold under the MPM brand in 2017 with resin parts, spray masks and new decals, and in 2019 by Hobby 2000 with a range of new decal schemes. High Plains entered the market with an injection kit of the Mark II Bowfighter in 1996, following this with a range of kits with resin and white metal parts as recently as 2011. In 148th scale, Tamiya came to market in 1997 with their new tooling, most recently released in 2002 in a combo box with a universal carrier vehicle. Revel released a kit of the Mark X Bowfighter in 148th scale in 2018, and has followed this with some new parts releases, most recently this Mark 1F Nightfighter in 2020. The only 132nd scale kit available is the Revel 1 first made in 1973. This had its last parts and decals makeover in 2014. By the way, I understand that Infinity Models will be releasing a 132nd scale bow fighter later this year. Watch this space for news as it happens. And finally, at the other end of the scale range, Mark I Models has a whole host of bow fighters in one 144th scale. Starting in 2015, there have been six further releases, totaling around 20 scheme and variant options. So here's our box. Adam Tooby artwork on the front. As usual, very, very evocative design. Of course, in more modern um, boxes, this design goes all the way to the edge. So it's uh, not the current one, but the one before, in terms of design anyway. But it's in the range as it is, essentially. Um, two scheme callouts here as well to show you what two schemes are available for in, within this kit anyway. On the side are some renderings from the CAD files, computer-aided design files to show it's the details and the overall look of the model. On the other side, and I always forget they're printed the other way, are a brief history of the aircraft, a reprise of the two scheme options, but here telling you what the scheme options are, the colour callouts for generally the aircraft and all the other options, and of course your flying hours token and your skill level. Skill level two. So it should be achievable by anyone who's made a kit before and, and got away, yeah, got a nice result. I was about to say got away with it, made a nice kit. You know, you made a kit of, say, starter set of a Spitfire or something like that. You've made it. You think, yep, I enjoyed that. You should be able to make this without any real problems. Token for two flying hours. Now, as always, point out, the, these are here so you can collect them. If you're a member of the Efforts Club, you can collect these towards a free kit in the future. You can, if you're not a member of the club, or indeed if you are a member of the club and you don't want to collect these things, you can donate them to Models for Heroes. I would be really delighted if you did. A link to the information on this wonderful charity is in the information box below. Okay, let's have a look inside the box then. As usual, we will find a big bag of parts. We'll go through all these parts in a while. There's an instruction sheet here. Again, fairly typical Airfix instruction sheet. Once again, we'll have a look at that in more detail. There's the decal sheet as well. Common decals and the two squadron markings. Interestingly, I haven't seen this before, on the box, there's 
a load of hints and tips like using clear fix to put clear parts on, um, masking parts with say mask oil or whatever and put varnish on before you put the decals on, which is interesting to remind people to do that. How to use decals, how to place decals, hints and tricks go to YouTube. Yeah, but we all know about that. Um, read the instructions, um, paint small paces on the frame. It's interesting, they call them frames and then they call them on the sprue here. So, I don't know. Um, using nippers to cut apart, pegs to hold things together, build and paint following instructions. There you go, just do as you're told. But anyway, I, that's the first time I've noticed those on the box. Do you know what? I guess that's actually quite a useful thing. On the back, there's a big advert for the FX Club. Um, it seems reasonably up to date. But remember, this isn't the very, very latest box. Um, there's another box just after this one. So you know, this should all be fairly up to date anyway. This is frame A. It has the backbone of the aircraft, I guess, the, the floor of the whole center. It has the bottom of the fuselage with the cannon ports, engines, wheels, um, engine parts here, and the fin. Oh, and all the rockets as well. Just notice those. Rockets. Rockets are molded in one piece, which is quite nice. Frame B, and we have the fuselage, we have the rudder, the undercarriage doors, uh, various bits and pieces, uh, ailerons, I'm guessing. Uh, these are, uh, I think these are going to be mountings for the rocket, rocket mountings here, undercarriage legs here and here, and two crew. Frame C, and we have the rest of the undercarriage, have torpedo, have the main spars, we have Various bits of cockpit detail here, um, some guns, exhausts, tailplanes, props, and two um, tailplanes, horizontal stabilizers, if you will. But notice they're already made with the dihedral, so you don't have to worry about it. Frame D, very straightforward, the wings. Um, I'm guessing these are maybe weapons bay weapon doors i don't know i'll find out later but they're um they're not part of the wings i know that that's where the ailerons go um there's going to be some wing tips somewhere or actually this is all molded in here uh yeah so wings mainly frame e a few more bits and pieces um these look like more weapons things maybe fuel tanks um tail wheels tail fillets as well this is the thimble nose for the radar version if you're doing the radar version um the torpedo body as well and then lastly frame f which is all the transparent parts of the aircraft so the pilot's canopy windshield um, some wing lights and the uh, navigator position with uh with and without cutouts for the rear gun and the wing identification lamps, things like that. Now, if we have a close look at the plastic, it's, I think it's very, very well molded, actually. Um, plastic feels good. Uh, very clean lines. The lines are probably a little deep for some people, but uh, for simpler modelers including myself that will make it a lot easier to do things like the panel lines and panel washes um, all of these details here will be easy to pick up as well the only downside with a, a deep panel line is setting the decals into it but you know we can do that with some solutions um, that should be relatively easy there's no real flash i can see to be honest, on these parts anyway. They just look very crisp for airfix. Uh, you know, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. You know, a lot of the time you look at airfix kits and they think, oh God, that looks rough. It looks like soapy and sort of glossy and you know that's never gonna work. And it does once you use up prime it and all that, but this actually looks like it's gonna work straight away. All those um, rivet marks are beautifully done. 
Now here is an interesting thing. Um, here we have the pilot and observer gunner, whatever the, the back, backseat chappy was. You know, I suppose observer, weapons aimer, air gunner, WAPAG, navigator, I don't know. Anyway, loads and loads of jobs. On on the uh, night flight ones, of course, here's a radar operator. Um, look how nicely these are moulded. Um, you can even see the chap's ties. They're very well dressed, I will say, for go to war. But yes, you can actually see their, their ties on this. These are beautifully moulded. And... I have to say, somewhat better than other kits I've seen recently from Airfix. They look you know, more of a good size, really, as well. More of a, a decent size, but really, really beautifully moulded. Now, I don't know if it is the plastic, um, whether it's the moulds, whether the... It can't be the 3D designs of the pilots are going out of shape, because they don't. They're 3D, they're digital. But look, all these, these lines are lovely. These very small pieces, very fine pieces, absolutely no flash on any of the rails there. That's going to make life a lot easier during construction. And as I mentioned earlier, the rockets are single piece mouldings. Now, I've seen all sorts of things from different companies. Uh, you know, sometimes you get the, the rocket body and the tail assembly is a separate molding completely or you get to mold them in two halves which is just a nightmare for some reason on this kit they've been able to mold them all in one with the mounting alignment absolutely spot on with an absolute minimum of any nonsense on that i mean there's a tiny 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 bit of flash on there but otherwise, you know, these are incredibly clean. All of these pieces are beautifully clean. Bottom of the fuselage looks really nice with the um, cannon ports at the bottom there. And there's even an aerial moulded in. This is this is probably top quality stuff, I have to say. This, for, this is really good quality. This is the um, original nose, which is the one I'll be using. Of course, the, there was a thimble nose for the radar equipped aircraft later on but really nice plastic really well molded it's it's a paler gray than the plastic that's released now and i just wonder whether this this here was the right plastic and they've deviated away from it again for some reasons i don't know the modern plastic is a darker gray with a hint of like brown to it this is beautiful I've, I've noticed other kits using this plastic, uh, the P40, for example, um, absolutely beautifully moulded and really, really exquisitely made. Uh, this is that that generation. That this kit is definitely of that standard. The instruction sheet, as normal for Airfix, um, little history of the aircraft, some basic specifications. Uh, yeah, interesting. Yep, Imperial first, metric second on these, which is fine. Um, five languages: English, French, German, Spanish, and Swedish. General instructions here, ICOM translations here, and then absolutely standard, normal, modern Airfix instructions. There's um, hints of colour call outs and as usual the things you did in the previous step are highlighted in red so there you put the spars on there the spars are shown in red because that's what you did in the last one instructions for drilling holes in case you're putting stand on uh, anything underneath uh, I don't know if that's radar or fuel tank torpedo of course um, and then in the wings holes for the rockets if you're putting the rockets on at the end we have two scheme options here we have a bowfighter tf-10 of number 45 squadron in malaya in 1940 late 1949 that's kind of interesting because the malayan emergency was madad's ship hms triumphs um first action in the far east before the korean war kicked off in the following year of course anyway um operation fire dog apparently says that 
um, rockets, torpedo, uh, well, that's not fuel, that's fuel, that, um, the later radar nose, night scheme, all very nice. And then there is number 489 Squadron Royal New Zealand Air Force based at Dalhaghy in Scotland in 1945 with again the thimble nose um, torpedo on this one and no rockets. And here we have the decal sheet as usual. At the top we have the common decal, some stencils and things. That, glad to say relatively few on this aircraft. Here is the uh, 45 Squadron markings for the night fighter, night intruder aircraft. And here 489 Squadron, Royal New Zealand Air Force, the day torpedo um, aircraft. Because it's a daytime scheme, there's many, many more decals that have to be put on because there's more stencils. But it's OK. It's not that many. And here, if we're looking close up at the decals, they do look lovely. This is a 0.5 millimeter propelling pencil lead. So, you know, you can see a lot of these stencils aren't even half a millimeter tall, but absolutely crystal clear to read. Beautifully printed as usual by Cartograph. Um, I'll try and get. Yeah, there we go. That's the, the instrument panel. That's fine. That's looking okay. Um, the printing registration, absolutely spot on. You can see on the roundels, uh, very even. There's no sort of lopsidedness at all. Beautifully printed, beautiful colours, absolutely wonderful registration. But then they're cartograph, which is why FX spent a lot of money signing them up to the programme. However, um, wonderful as the decals are, included in my box, um, just, I don't know, but maybe it was a second-hand thing in auction that I was sent. Um, I don't know if it was bought with this. But anyway, the box I received also had a set of extra decal, extra decal options um, for various Bofarta Mark 9s and TF9s and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm tempted by alternative scheme there's lots of very lovely schemes in here um, I, I kind of like these far east ones with the dark green and dark earth um, and the, the sort of blue and pale blue roundels they're very nice uh, the naval colors here coastal command colors with um, extra dark sea gray and um, black uh, the sky underneath yeah, it's quite nice. Um, that's lovely. The Australian one's lovely with the tiger on the nose. I do like that. That's a more conventional um, Coastal Command option there. More Coastal Command. Well, that's rather nice with those red and yellow decals, the markings there. Um, a TT-21 target towing aircraft from, from Australia. Um, and here, another one from... Uh, Woomera, very nice. More markings of Coastal Command there. Not quite sure yet which one I'm going to go for. Although, there's another beautiful sort of um, foliage green one from Australia. But then, we have this, which is the... Uh, the, the Coastal Command one in all over white with a bit of extra dark sea grey or dark slate grey on this one actually. This has got both extra dark sea grey and dark slate grey. So it's got the uh, the naval, northern temperate naval um, camouflage rather than just extra dark sea grey. That's kind of interesting. And here it is. I don't know if you can see the difference. And it's got a Yagi um, antenna out the front which I'd have to make obviously but I do love it I do love this color scheme the white with just these bits of cam camouflage on I, I just adore it so I'm very likely to be doing that one um, on all these of course that, that little snub nose comes in the kit as we've seen 
So um, also does note here that um, quite a lot of them had red oxide sealant applied around the wing root join, um, which seems a sensible precaution. And in fact, they show it here. That's going to be fun to do. That's a red primer around the wing root join. That's going to be really, really interesting. Anyway, so that's what we're going to be doing, I think. I think we're going to be doing this one. Um, we'll put the aerial on as well because I've got some aerial cord. Yeah, I think that's what we'll go for. So that's the kit. I think it looks really nice. Um, I think the plastic looks amazing. I think the plastic looks better than the plastic I've been seeing recently from Airfix. Um, certainly the figures are so much better molded. Uh, I, I don't understand what's been going on there. Anyway, uh, I'll be building it soon and um, let's see how it actually goes together. If you want to see that and you haven't done so yet, please do subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and you'll get a notification of when that video and all my videos turn up on my channel. And of course, anything you like, please do remember, Imperial thumbs up on the like button below. Every like counts. That's it for now. So thanks very much for watching. Hope to see you again very soon. Take care and goodbye.